Hello, thank you for clicking onto this video and welcome to the Hamamatsu video channel. Many of you in the photonics industry may be familiar with us for our famous detectors and while we will continue to manufacture and supply these detectors, we also wanted to introduce you to our lineup of spectrometers and spectrum sensors containing these same detectors. Our spectrometers cover the whole gamut from UV to the near infrared. From our gratings based options to our interferometer based options, our spectrometers provide the accuracy, resolution, and sensitivity users require and all in form factors that are magnitudes smaller than benchtop spectrometers. We manufacture our own high throughput transmissions gratings. So every transmission grading and image sensor that goes into each spectrometer is manufactured, put together, and inspected to be sure that it receives our seal of approval. So whether you're looking to measure sugar content in fruit or distinguish between pharmaceutical components through their sirs raman response, our compact spectrometer sizes paired with their high quality performance make these options beneficial for users looking to take their measurements out from the lab and onto the field. Today, we'll be presenting one of our spectrometer options. We'll share an example test setup, run through some sample data to give you an idea of what type of analysis is possible using our standard evaluation software. We'll introduce some alternative evaluation software options and discuss possible applications using this spectrometer. Today, we'll be testing the C13555MA thin flat mini spectrometer to calculate its signal to noise ratio or SNR. SNR is important because it represents your level of measurement accuracy. So the higher your SNR, the more accurate your measurements. Housed in a compact and thin case, this spectrometer contains the optics, image sensor, and driver circuit necessary to perform various portable spectroscopic measurements for colorimetry applications, for example. Each of these components are manufactured by Hamamatsu Photonics. This allows for us to have an understanding and control of the production of these parts from start to finish, resulting in high performance, high reliability, reproducible portable devices. To give you some idea of how to test the spectrometer, we've assembled an example test setup. So shown here is the C13555MA. Then we have a USB cable, a halogen light source, two fiber optic cables, an iris, and a PC. We've had our light source plugged in and going through warm-up for about 30 minutes to ensure stable output. Today we're using a broadband halogen source. Taking the SMA connector on one of our fiber optic cables, screw it into the corresponding SMA connector on your light source. In each spectrometer data sheet, we provide specifications on suitable optical fibers. For this spectrometer, we recommend using either a 400 or a 600 micron core diameter fiber with a numerical aperture of 0.22 and SMA connection to the spectrometer. It's important to make sure that the fiber you use matches these specifications to optimize throughput. With higher throughput comes higher signal collection and higher SNR. Again, it is this higher SNR that will allow for high accuracy measurements. Today, we'll go over SNR calculations based on our webinar on understanding spectrometer signal-to-noise ratio. Now, going back to our hardware, in the event that your light source saturates the spectrometer even at the minimum integration time, we recommend using an iris to adjust how much light travels through the fiber to the spectrometer. Unlike adjusting the current or voltage supplied to a lamp, using an iris allows you to affect how much light is seen by the detector without making any changes to color temperature. So, taking the other end of the first fiber optic cable, we'll connect this to our iris. Taking our second fiber optic cable, we'll connect this to our iris as well. And then, taking the final end of our second fiber optic cable, we'll connect this to our spectrometer. And that is it as far as our optical connections go. All this spectrometer requires to be operated is USB bus power, making it ideal for portable implementations where access to a power supply or outlet may not be available. 
So, taking our USB 2.0 cable, we'll use our micro USB-N, connect it to the spectrometer, connect our USB-N to our PC, and that is it. We are ready to begin testing. When you first receive a spectrometer from Hamamatsu, depending on the model you receive, it can come with the corresponding USB cable, CD with evaluation software, hardware instruction manual, and software instruction manual. We offer different types of spectrometer software. In general, our evaluation software is intended for initial testing. Functions include setting parameters to control spectrometer measurement, performing dark subtraction on light measurements, and performing Gaussian fitting to plots. We also offer software support, such as DLL command files and software development kits. These tools are vital for users looking to design their own application-specific software. The files saved from our software are typically in CSV format, allowing for users to analyze data as they require. If ever you find yourself in a position where you do not have access to the software that you need, please contact our sales offices. So let's start by opening the appropriate software for the C13555 spectrometer. Contained within the software instruction manual that comes with this spectrometer are directions to install, operate, and uninstall this software. A useful table is also included in the manuals that goes over the functions behind each of the buttons in the software. So to open up the spectrometer, go to File and find Open Spectrometer. You'll select your spectrometer from the drop-down menu, noting that each spectrometer has its own unique unit identification number. Now, with the spectrometer open, let's monitor the output to get an initial reading of what it's seeing. We'll set some parameters for this monitored measurement by going to Tool, Set Parameter, and then opening it up to find a couple of options we can toggle with. For now, we'll be setting the integration time to the minimum value. This can be found on the spectrometer data sheet. For the CU13555MA, this is 11 microseconds, and the maximum integration time available is 100 milliseconds. As shown in the figure, while increasing integration time increases throughput, it also results in higher dark A to D counts. If you can afford higher dark A to D counts, longer integration times may be suitable for you. Just keep in mind as well that longer integration times equate to overall longer measurement periods. So with our integration time set, we'll check what output we're getting using these settings. After closing the tab, we'll open the shutter on our light source and we'll select this button to start monitoring output. Keep in mind that the data that's shown here will not be saved, it's simply for display purposes. If we look at our plot, we see we have an A to D count of about 3000. We can adjust this value by changing our integration time. So we'll adjust the integration time for 1300 microseconds this time and see what kind of plot we get. So that looks much better. The goal here is to maximize the amount of light the sensor can detect without hitting the saturation point of the readout electronics. This spectrometer has 16-bit resolution, so it's capable of outputting counts up to around 65,000 ADD counts, and we can adjust the input to get around that range to saturate the sensor without saturating the electronics. One of the telltale signs of saturation is a flat line at around the 65,000 ADD count mark. Now that we've monitored output, we can move on to start taking measurements that will be saved for analysis. For today, we'll find the signal to noise ratio for this spectrometer. We need to take a dark measurement to give us baseline information on the dark noise. We'll start by going back to set parameters and setting the number of repeat counts. This will be reflected in the saved data as the number of scans or columns of data saved. We'll set this value to 1, and then we'll set the average values to 100. So this means that the one dark scan that we measure will be an average of 100 scans. Now with the shutter on our light source closed, we'll click this button to take a measurement. As we can see on the right, this gauge shows only one scan is being logged. With the gauge filled, we know the measurement is complete, and we now need to assign this data as our dark data. We'll do so by going over to Tool and selecting Arithmetic. 
So this tab ensures that the file that is saved reflects the most recent data or the present measurement as the dark data. This can also be used for reference when applying functions such as dark subtraction. This can be selected below. So now that that's set, we can take a light measurement. This time, we'll set our repeat counts to 100, and we'll set our averages to 1. In the data, this will be reflected as 100 columns of scans. Now, to take this measurement, we'll reopen the shutter, and then we'll click this button to take the light measurement. If we look at the gauges for this measurement, we'll see on the bottom right that each scan is taken until a total of 100 scans is collected. And now that the gauges are filled, the measurement is complete, and we can move on to data analysis. We'll start by saving the data we just measured. To do so, go to File, and select Save Text Data. All right, so let's take a look at this data and see what we have. In the top left-hand corner, we have information on the spectrometer itself. Below that are the parameters for our light measurement, and then below that is the data. This first column represents the pixel number. Next to that is the corresponding wavelength. Next to that is the dark data, with each row representing an average of 100 scans. And then next to that is the reference data, which we had not taken. And next to that are all 100 light measurement scans. So to calculate SNR, we'll recall that SNR equals total signal divided by total noise. To calculate the total signal, we'll take the average across all 100 light measurement scans. From this average, we'll take the dark noise and subtract it out. We'll then apply this across all of the wavelengths. For the total noise, we'll take the standard deviation across all 100 light measurement scans. And just as before, apply this across all of the wavelengths. Now to calculate SNR, all we need to do is simply take the total signal and divide the total noise, and apply this again across all of the wavelengths. So if we plot this data with total signal and total noise on one axis and signal to noise ratio on the other axis, we'll see that the total signal plot shows us the same figure that was displayed in the evaluation software. If we look at the SNR plot, we'll see a maximum SNR of 275 at around the 750 nanometer range. This plot shows the importance of knowing your wavelength range of interest as it relates to the spectrometer sensitivity and eventual SNR that is obtained. Another plot we can put together is noise versus signal. Now, if we take the log of each axis, we'll get our photon transfer curve. At the lower light level of range, we'll see that measurements are dark noise limited. However, as signal levels increase, the system becomes more shot noise limited rather than dark noise limited. This plot shows the importance of knowing your light levels and how it relates to overcoming the spectrometer noise floor and how it relates to obtaining shot noise limited regime operation. These compact and smart designs open the door to new applications. We can see this spectrometer being used for applications such as colorimetry, fluorescence measurements, emission spectroscopy measurements, and absorption spectroscopy measurements. Are you looking to use this spectrometer or do you use this spectrometer for something different? Let us know in the comments below.